to all the attendees good evening to you uh, from here in mumbai india uh, we hope you are doing uh, well healthy and safe and thank you for joining us today for the knowledge at kpt admissions 101 workshop series today we have a very special guest joining us uh, her name is miss rebecca k from california state university san bernardino and i know csu is a very popular option for many of you students uh, parents and guidance counselors so thank you for joining us today and Ms. Rebecca K would be presenting on the topic U.S. academic culture, the U.S. classroom and professors, as many of you have seen in our outreach emails. So I'm going to, in a, uh, uh, after a quick minute, uh, hand over the stage and the microphone to Ms. Rebecca. Before we begin our session for the day, I'm just going to quickly go through some housekeeping rules. Um, your, the Q&A session will be towards the end. We know in the past few sessions we've had questions coming along. So uh, uh, Ms. Rebecca will be answering them towards the end of the session so that you ha can have your questions answered. The first 30 minutes will be on her session topic as always, and the second 30 minutes will be on um, her institution, which is California State University San Bernardino. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over the stage and the microphone to uh, Ms. Rebecca and all the best. And thank you so much, Ms. Rebecca, for joining us. I know it's very early in the morning out there. We truly appreciate your kind time. Thank you so much once again. All right, thank you, Canal, And greetings to everyone from San Bernardino, California. So today we're going to talk first a little bit about classroom culture in the USA and some of the, the key points and tips that um, our faculty, when talking with them, that they suggest and recommend to students as they begin their university studies at any institution in the USA. So just to give you a little bit of a summary of what today's agenda is going to look like, we're going to first talk a little bit about what a college and a major means. And then we'll talk a bit about academic advisors because they are a key part of, of the classroom and academic experience at a US institution. We'll also talk about classroom culture, citing sources, and then academic resources that you commonly find at US institutions and what, they, what you can utilize them for um, to continue to improve upon your academic performance while you're studying in the USA. So I first wanted to define a couple of terms that get used a lot at US institutions, um, and sometimes um, students just need a little bit of clarification on what they all mean. So a major would be the academic subject area that you focus on, um, while you're in your undergraduate studies. Typically, a major course will be anywhere from an equivalent of about a year and a half of coursework up to two and a half years of coursework at most liberal studies universities. So you are spending the majority of your four year studies uh, focusing in on that major. And then your minor is the secondary focus of academic studies while you are a student at a university. Typically, the coursework equivalent in time that you'd be spending in your minor will be anywhere from one to two semesters. Um, that's pretty typical. So you are spending less time within that minor area of studies, um, but you are spending a prolonged period of time compared to your other general education requirements or other elective coursework. And then the term college is used a lot, and this is used interchangeably um, at some institutions. So the first definition that I don't have up here for a college um, would be, for, it would describe a, or a, an institution that only grants a bachelor's degree. So you may hear of certain types of institutions that are called a college. So like St. Olaf College, for example, um, or um, even Harvard, uh, the undergraduate uh, institution is called Harvard College. And then the larger institution is Harvard University. So the, a college is a higher education school that only focuses on undergraduate studies. The second definition that is used at any institution is the definition that's up there. And so a college is the academic division um, where similar majors are grouped together. So that way there is one kind of academic leader. It's called the dean that would be the point person to make sure that all of those majors within that division or that college um, are performing academically well. 
so to give you an example of what kind of college breakdowns look like, um, at CSUSB, we have five different colleges. And so you'll see there, like, for example, the College of Arts and Letters, all of those major areas of studies focus within fine arts or kind of expressive and creative arts. Whereas like the College of Natural Sciences, you'll see those major courses there. Those are all very um, focused on science and technology. So each of the deans of these different colleges um, typically are an expert in one of these fields and they work with the faculty to make sure that their programs maintain accreditation, maintain academic excellence. Um, and so you'll hear um, academic advisors or faculty talking about the College of Natural Science or the College of Education. This is what they're talking about. So then talking a little bit about an academic advisor and who an academic advisor is and what do they do. So typically an academic advisor for undergraduate studies will be either a faculty member within the major or a professional staff member. Um, so someone who doesn't necessarily teach classes but is trained to understand the academic um, structure of the program. And their focus is within the major department. An academic advisor's purpose is to guide students through their registration and their scheduling of classes and mapping out their degree plan for the four years. So they are um, a point person for a student if they have questions about sequencing of courses, when courses are offered, what courses are required to finish their degree. Typically academic advisors, students meet one-on-one -on -one with them once a semester. So as you get admitted to a university, you will get contact information from your institution about scheduling a, a virtual session with your academic advisor to select your courses for your first semester. Following that, you typically meet with them in person and they just um, speak with you about what courses you'd like to schedule. Um, if there's specific prerequisites that are required, they'll walk you through what you have to take. And then they get you registered for your classes. In addition, they are a point person for support. So if you um, are struggling with um, scheduling or sequencing or even with a course, um, they are a point person to give you more guidance on academic resources on campus. If you need to you know, tap into tutoring services and things like that, they are a good point person for that. If you go on to um, probation, if you are struggling in your class and you go on to what's called academic probation, um, which typically means that your GPA is below um, a certain point, typically it's a 2.0. So roughly below a 70 to 65%, um, they will be your point of contact um, to kind of walk you through what you have to do to get released from that probation or what the consequences would be if you can't um, achieve that release from your probation. Um, they also will be your point person typically for your graduation application. So any student who graduates from a, an institution or university has to complete a certain paperwork um, so that way the university can confirm that the student has successfully completed all of the requirements for their degree and so that way they can begin processing their actual diploma and final transcripts so typically your academic advisor is your point person there at our institution for most of our undergrad programs for the first two years students meet with a professional staff member. They kind of walk students through the general requirements for their major and for the institution and get them completed with all of that. And then typically the second two years, the students meet with a faculty academic advisor who is a full-time faculty member at the university within their major. And they walk them through building a focus area. They talk with them more about um, kind of specializing within their fields and walking them through what they need to complete the degree. So that's typically the sequencing that we see at our institution in terms of academic advisors. So we talked a little bit about academic advisors. This next um, group of uh, professionals within our institutions 
in the US um, are the professors. So most professors at universities have a doctorate degree within their field. You will find at some institutions there are um, faculty members that only have a master's degree. Um, colleges, when we talk about those colleges that only grant undergraduate degrees, you will see also this uh, diversity of master's degree and doctorate faculty. Um, U.S. professors, typically um, they will teach about three, two to three courses a semester and then they are also tasked with doing research and having scheduled office hours. Um, so common hours that students can come and meet with them. So they do have to balance all of that within their schedule. Within the classroom experience, you'll find that U.S. professors um, have a very unique kind of way that they teach and it, it is different even from U.S. high schools. Um, they see students in their courses as future experts and professionals within their field of study. And so they do respect the opinions of students within the class and they do want the students to have the space to be able to have active conversations and discussions, debates within the classroom. And so you do see um, faculty members having this kind of open discussion of you know, different kinds of opinions within the class. So for example, if you are in um, like a biology class and you're talking about trends within um, microorganism research, they will present maybe a couple of different ways that research is being done and then ask students to discuss and debate the benefits or um, drawbacks within those different types of um, processes because they want students to be able to have the opportunity to kind of discuss and um, really be able to think through those different processes. That way when they go off into research within microorganisms or things like that, um, they can weigh out the pros and cons of any lab that they're considering. Um, there is a high expectation for participation within class. A lot of times part of the final grade is contingent upon participation. Um, you do see some faculty members will have their class roster sitting on their desk and as discussions are happening and debate is happening within the class, you'll see them marking something on those sheets. They're marking how many times different students are discussing or the level of, of engagement different students had in the class that day and that weighs within to that final grade of participation. Faculty members also, um, since they do have this kind of viewpoint of students as future kind of colleagues almost in a way that, they, that their, future, their students will be researchers in the future that they may be um, working side by side with, there is a high expectation of what what kind of assignments are going to be put in the class and the timing of when those assignments have to be done. Um, so usually in US classes, um, there isn't this kind of schedule sequencing of lecture for 15 weeks followed by a final exam that is kind of the catalyst of the grade. You will find intermittently between those 16 weeks of courses um, that you will have different types of assignments that are due. So there may be that participation grade in class to be in class and to be actively discussing things in class. There will be research projects that may be due. There may be lab projects that may be due. And then maybe a couple of exams over the course of the, the actual course. So if a faculty member has a designated date that a certain research project or a paper is due, there is a high expectation that that assignment has to be submitted at that time. Um, if students submit coursework late, um, they may be subject to a cut in their grade, depending on how many days late they are. When you actually enter a U.S. classroom, um, it is very customary that you do greet your professor. professor. Some professors want to be addressed by their last name. Others prefer to be addressed by their first name. 
until you know how they want to be addressed, it is recommended that you address them as doctor followed by their last name. Um, even if you don't know if they have a doctorate degree or not, it's better to just say that to show them respect and they will clarify for you saying, oh, I, you know, I don't have my doctorate yet. You can just call me, you know, John or you can call me Mr. or Professor Smith or things like that. But on that first day of class, when you meet your professor, go ahead and title them as, you know, Dr. Smith or things like that. Um, we talked about class participation. I can't emphasize that enough. Um, and then also talking about promptness when it comes to coming to class. Um, faculty members, because of their scheduling, the fact that they're teaching, they're researching, they're spending time within their office hours, um, there is a high value of time. And they do see their time as very precious because there is a lot of obligations that they have to the institution. Um, and so to show up to a class late, to try to sneak into a class late, faculty members notice that um, and it is a, a sign of disrespect um, to them because they are professionals within their field. They are experts within what they do. And to have that time where you're working what, almost one-on-one -on -one with an expert within a classroom experience, um, to, to come to class late, it is a sign that you don't value that time that they're giving you um, as highly as they perceive it. And so it is really important to come to class on time. Um, within my undergraduate experiences, um, I had a faculty member who at, on the hour when the, the course had to start, he would go over to the classroom door, lock the door and start teaching. If a student came late, the student would have to write a note and put it under the, the, the door to explain why they were late and then he would decide whether or not he wanted to let them in. It's a very extreme example, um, but I think it helps illustrate um, how important it is for faculty members to see that their students are coming on time for their lectures and are actively engaged in those lectures. Within the, the classroom experience, it is um, highly recommended that you ask questions. Um, faculty members like to hear questions even if the question seems silly or maybe something that they might have already addressed, um, questions to a professor shows that you are engaged in what's going on and you're thinking through what they're saying and maybe there's things that they're saying that um, are a little bit beyond what the class is prepared for at this point. Um, keep in mind that they're experts in their field. Sometimes they move a little too quickly within a certain area of their lecture. Um, so you can ask questions within class with, you know, raising your hand and waiting for them to address the question. Um, or you can always email or meet your professor during their office hours to ask your questions. And then in terms of cell phones and what you do with your cell phone when you're in class, um, you should sh shut your cell phone off completely. Don't put it on vibrate or anything like that. And keep your cell phone in your bag under your desk. Um, don't leave it on your desk while you're in class. Um, professors can see that, that you have your phone sitting right there in front of you with your notes um, and in talking about, you know, the respective time and things like that. It's so important for them to see um, that you respect their time and their space and you keep that phone off. So talking a little bit more deeper within classroom culture, we talked about the participation culture and how important that is within US classrooms. Um, just thinking about US culture in general, we like asking a lot of questions. We like kind of rebelling in a lot of ways. That's kind of how our country was formed. And so that is very much within kind of the academic culture. And that's always been a piece of the academic culture. Um, universities in the US have always been kind of a catalyst that has asked questions and has um, started movements and changes within the country. And so um, this continues kind of as a legacy piece for universities that they want to see students bringing those questions and um, bringing different theories or ideas into the class. 
as we talked about, classes typically are a combination of different projects and exams. So there is a balance and you will see that information um, on that first day of class. With um, classes, they will have um, what's called a syllabus. So this will be passed out typically on the first day of school. And it will outline what the, the sequence is gonna look like for the 16 weeks. So what are going to be the key projects how highly those projects are going to be weighed in the overall percentage, when those things are due, when the faculty members office hours are in case you want to meet with them. Um, so there, it's a really key piece to help you kind of map out your game plan for that course. Every time you come to class, um, typically there's some kind of a reading or some materials that you need to prepare before class that will be discussed. You need to get that um, reading or whatever um, articles that you have to prepare, make sure that's all prepared and be prepared to discuss those readings and the topic at hand. Um, I've seen faculty members, if they're having a classroom discussion, they will, um, if, if students aren't discussing, they will start calling out on students and asking them to address certain topics that were within the assigned reading. And so you do want to make sure that you are prepared in case you have a professor that um, kind of addresses their class that way. You don't want to be caught not having prepared that reading. And being prepared to offer an opinion on things, um, even if the opinion differs from what the faculty member has been kind of discussing in the class, a lot of times they will discuss conventional um, theories or ideas within a subject, and they may have had you prepare readings that kind of argued against that. Be prepared to offer your opinion on which one you find most sound or which one you find more, most convincing and why. Um, they want to see that you've looked at all the different options and see your thought process on deciding what you find to be the most consistent within what you're discussing as the subject. If the professors, um, you know, are, are moving too quick within a subject, do ask them questions about the subject and do ask them to repeat what they just said. Um, they won't see that as a sign of disrespect. Um, they do want to make sure that when you're in the lecture that they're being clear and are covering what you need. Um, and if they're talking too fast, you can ask them to slow down. Um, some students also find it helpful to record classes. So to have an audio recorder the, to record the, the lecture. If that's something that you find may be helpful, um, it is typically okay with professors for you to record the class, but you do want to ask them before you start recording. So if you find that that would be something that would be helpful for you, um, do meet with your professor one-on-one -on -one and explain to them that um, to help you understand the lecture better, you'd like to be able to play it back. Is it okay if I record the session? And then as I said, with all professors, they do, they are required to hold office hours. So this is hours that they have um, in their university office that are designated specifically to students in their classes that may have questions about assignments or what was covered in lectures or just the subject matter in general. And so utilizing those office hours can be really helpful. Um, and professors like to see their students during that time. Otherwise, they're sitting there by themselves. And so to go and spend, you know, some time with your questions with them, it shows that you're, you're really serious about the class. And of course, if um, you have any questions that are outside of those office hours or outside of class, you can always email your professor to ask those questions. So then talking about citing sources, um, this is a really big piece of, in U.S. Um, academics. When you're doing any kind of research paper, um, you will have to cite any resources that you find that are outside of your understanding of the subject. So any um, ideas, theories, notions that you cover within a paper or presentation, um, you will have to um, credit whoever came up with those ideas. Every professor is going to want you to cite sources a little different. And so there are roughly eight to 10 different citations. There's 
three common ones, MLA, APA, and Chicago style are the most typical. Every professor is going to have a preference on how sources should be cited. Um, so if you're not sure how to cite a source, if it's not clear in the syllabus, which it usually is, they typically will put that information in their syllabus. Do ask your professor what they prefer. And then most importantly, when you are citing sources, um, make sure that you don't plagiarize. So you may be asking, what is plagiarizing? So plagiarism, um, according to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, is the act of using another person's words or ideas without giving credit to the person. So this would be not citing some information that you had found or improperly citing it. So if you use a direct quote, if you use someone's ideas, if you um, take so many words from it and, and basically summarize someone's idea, you do need to credit where it came from. So a couple of examples of plagiarism would be turning in someone's complete paper as your own when you did not write that paper, um, copying words or ideas from someone else without giving credit, um, or taking a quote and taking out just a couple words so that way it's not a direct quote and then not citing that um, quotation, that kind of fused quotation. All of those are a couple of examples. Um, U.S. universities take plagiarism very seriously. Most institutions, if you are caught with plagiarizing, um, you will be put on academic suspension or you may be academically dismissed from the institution entirely. Um, with institutions, they do have technology resources that they can scan papers through to see if that paper comes up anywhere on the internet or if certain terms or ideas that don't have a citation come up, um, it'll trigger all of that so that way um, faculty members can see if this is an original work or if this work is properly referencing other people's work um, appropriately. So that is a very important thing to keep in mind as well. Talking about resources that you'll find on most US campuses, um, on any US campus, um, that hosts F1 international students, there will be some kind of an international student center or international student advisor. Um, this will be your point for any questions about immigration questions, as well as any type of personal questions, advising, or academic resource um, seeking. So if you're not sure who to turn to, you can always turn to the international office at the campus and they will direct you to the proper people on campus that can give you the information that you need. The university library um, is also a great resource. You'll find, you know, of course, sources to write your papers, um, but you'll also find information about how to find sources. So if you're trying to um, locate spe very specific information like um, cybersecurity trends in the Middle East, for example, or something like that, and you don't really know where to find that information, you can always go to the librarians and they will give you um, more insight on how to seek out those sources. A lot of libraries will also have different types of workshops on like study skills and things like that, um, or study groups for classes. So it's also a great place to, to get that academic support. Most universities will also have a writing center. So a writing center, typically it is um, led by upperclassmen students who are typically English or writing majors. And they are there to help students um, with their papers. So you can bring a draft of a paper and they'll take a look and let you know um, if the flow is good, if it's making sense to them, if the paper really is kind of covering what the writing prompt is speaking about. Um, but they can also help you with citation and formatting of papers. So if you're not sure how to cite an MLA, you can always bring your draft to them and they will tell you um, what corrections need to be made to have a proper MLA citated paper. Those services are free. A lot of times they will have walk-in times that you can bring in a paper if an uh, advisor um, or you know, writing center kind of coach is available, you can meet with them. Otherwise, you can schedule an appointment uh, to meet one-on-one -on -one with those writing center uh, team members. 
Most institutions also will have a tutoring office. Most tutoring offices will cover um, kind of the, the general course for every um, subject area. So within a liberal arts education, every student from every background has to take a lab science, a mathematics course, a fine arts course, a writing course. And so tutoring services typically, they will have tutors that will cover all of those subjects. They may not cover very specialized courses um, in your major, so they may not cover um, Python for computer science, for example, um, but they will cover the general computer science, the introduction to computer science course. Most tutors, they're going to require you to set up an appointment um, and to request an appointment with the tutors. Um, and they can, you know, kind of help you if you have questions as you're preparing to study for exams and things like that. Um, another resource that you'll find at every institution is some kind of a disability access service. Um, sometimes they're called disability success services, or they have a lot of different terms that they'll use for that. Um, but this is the um, office that provides um, resources and support for students who may have um, physical or academic um, disabilities. So as part of um, in compliance with US law, um, every university has to have um, some kind of an advisor on campus that works with students um, who may need special accommodations. So classroom accommodations, typically you'll see um, what's called blind note takers. Um, so what this means is if um, you have a need to have somebody else take notes during class, um, they will assign a student and pay a student in your class to take notes. The notes will be passed to Disability Access Services who will then pass the notes to you. So the student in your class doesn't know who is getting the notes. Um, all that they are told is that there's a student in their class that needs the notes. They take notes and then pass it through the department to you. <coughs> um, other accommodations that are common are extended exam times um, or extensions on specific assignments. Um, so this is something that every institution offers um, for students who need that additional support and you are welcome to utilize that if it is something that you need. So a couple of last tips to just little, discuss a little bit. Um, in your first semester, these are some recommendations that we've had from students and faculty members um, to have a very you know, good and successful time. Number one, read over your syllabus for each class in the first week. This is a really important uh, first step because your syllabus is kind of your, your rules of the game or your map to success. Um, so you do wanna read through it, read through when the office hours are, um, what citations that your faculty member wants you to use in the class, and then also how assignments are gonna be weighed and when those assignments are going to be due. Number two, once you've read through those syllabi, you'll want to write all of your major assignments and tests in some kind of a calendar or planner. So whether you want to use a traditional paper calendar or planner that you put on your desk, um, or if you want to put an alert in your phone um, for every assignment, maybe 24 hours before those assignments are due, so that way you get an alarm that sounds off saying you've got something coming up pretty soon, make sure you have everything ready for it. Um, it's just good to kind of map it all out so you can see between all of your classes what things are coming due and what things may take more time and what could be done a little bit quicker. Number three, this is one that everyone struggles with. Um, as a student, I didn't do this for a while and then I started doing this and I found that I had more success sitting in the front row of class or the first two rows of class. Studies have shown that students who sit in the first two rows typically have a higher overall grade in the courses once the course finishes. Um, and there may be different things that attribute to that, but in one way, um, you can't hide in the front row. Um, you have to be engaged and pay attention. And faculty members take notice of who sits in the front row because they know that it's a very intimidating experience. Um, and so there is that you know, stronger rapport than that you build with your professors um, and they're more willing to, 
to sit down with you and help clarify things with you because they know that um, you've taken kind of that first step to really be engaged in the class. And as I said before, if you find that recording a class may be helpful, um, ask your professor before class if you could record the class, if you find that listening would be helpful. We find a lot of internationals find this helpful um, and a lot of our professors are okay with that, but you do want to ask beforehand. Number five, um, make friends in each of your classes, um, American friends that you, you know you can kind of build a friendship with and build a study partnership with. A lot of American students like to collaborate um, when it comes to studying for exams. Um, some students will share notes with each other um, so that way if you take down something that they may have missed and vice versa, um, you each can really work together to get through the class. Obviously, you can't share information when it comes to exams or write papers together, um, but it may be a helpful resource to have someone else read over drafts of papers who are in your class um, who are going through the same assignments and just to, to build that partnership with each other. Um, and of course, if you have any questions, you can meet your professor during their office hours. Um, so then a couple of points of contact, and I'll have this on the, the second kind of section that we're going to be discussing. Um, I know I'm a little bit over time on here, um, but should you have any questions, these are our points of contact. And I will also put in the chat my personal email. Um, so if you have any questions specifically for me, you're welcome to email me directly as well. So that's everything that I have for um, those academic tips. So um, before we get started to the next section, we're just going to thank you so much, uh, Rebecca, for sharing some very valuable information. Uh, we're just going to quickly, uh, for 30 seconds, have a quick poll. And the poll would be uh, about CSU San Bernardino. And I'm just going to quickly run it so everyone can see it on their screens right now. And the question for the day is, have you heard of CSU San Bernardino? So we uh, request all the uh, um, attendees to kindly answer this question as it will be helpful. Thank you. So we have about 30 seconds. I'm going to wait for five more seconds because I know Ms. Rebecca has to continue with the session. So three, two, one, go. And happy to hear. Uh, there's some of you who haven't, but I'm happy to hear an overwhelming majority have heard uh, of uh, CSU San Bernardino. And I'm going to hand over the mic uh, microphone once again to Rebecca. Thank you, Rebecca. All right. Thank you, Canal. Okay. So we're going to talk um, just briefly about my institution. I think I've got quite a few slides here, but we're just going to kind of hit the, the highlight points of this. Um, and as before, if you have questions, feel free to throw those in the q and I see we've got a couple of different questions from the first session. We will get those questions addressed as well, uh, but feel free to um, drop a few more in there as well, and we'll move forward. So um, as Kamel said, um, with our institution, we are part of the California State University system. You may be familiar with the system, uh, but just to give you a brief overview of what this system looks like, um, there are 23 um, campuses that grant bachelor's and master's degrees in the state of California. Um, we are public institutions like the UCs. The main difference is that the UCs go up to a doctorate level. So they do grant um, doctorate degrees, they grant MDs, um, JDs, things like that. For the CSU system, we only grant bachelor's and master's degrees since the majority of higher education students are only seeking degrees of those levels. Um, the state doesn't give every public institution access to those types of degrees. Um, there are over 1800 different bachelor's and master's degree programs and 400,000 students at the campuses. Um, we have one unified website at calstate.edu, so if you want to explore all the different campuses, you can take a look at there. 
Um, you'll see on the map of the campuses, my campus is down there in Southern California. Um, you'll see next to kind of Fullerton and Northridge um, in that greater Los Angeles area. So we will kind of focus in on there. Zooming in more to Southern California, this gives you a breakdown of what the kind of greater Los Angeles area looks like and where our campus is. So you'll see CSUSB is in that red star. We're just a little bit north of the kind of proper San Bernardino city. San Bernardino has about 200,000 uh, citizens who live there. Um, and within kind of the greater region um, that covers Rancho Cucamonga and Riverside, there are about a million people who live within about a 15 minute driving distance of campus. Um, so we are, you know, a very urban area um, of the greater Los Angeles area. In addition, um, you'll see a little dot there for Palm Springs, California. Um, Palm Springs is a very like heavy resort area. A lot of celebrities go there for vacations and things like that. Um, neighboring Palm Springs is Palm Desert, which is where our regional campus is located. Um, so our regional campus has a few degree programs, but it is also where our hospitality management program is uh, hosted since that Palm Springs region is one of the most highest um, tourist destinations um, in the state and in the country, um, that program is held exclusively there. And it's about an hour away from the main campus. So then to give you a little bit of a breakdown, the campus is just a little over 50 years old. We are a division two athletic uh, school. So for those who may not be familiar with uh, NCAA divisions, division one schools grant up to full scholarships for athletics, division twos grant some scholarship for athletics, but not full rides, so to say. And division three campuses do not grant any type of funding for athletics. Um, so we're there in that middle tier where we do have some athletic scholarships, but it would not cover all of tuition and housing. We have just over 20,000 students, roughly 18,000 are undergrad, 2,000 are postgraduate students, and over 800 international students. Uh, we just transitioned to a semester system when it comes to scheduling, and you'll see there a breakdown of where San Bernardino is in proximity to Los Angeles, San Diego, and Las Vegas, which are the larger urban areas that we're kind of in the middle of. Um, you'll see the picture of the students in the back there. Um, that is the campus library, and overlooking the campus library are the San Bernardino Mountains. Um, we are right by a big national forest called the San Bernardino National Forest. Um, in the winter, that whole mountain range has snow on it, um, but we're very fortunate to have um, a really, you know, beautiful location for our students to learn and grow. So then briefly talking about student life, um, you may have sessions coming up that talk about student organizations and student clubs. Um, we have approximately 180 current active student clubs. Um, you'll see a breakdown there of a couple of different types of organizations that we see. Um, but with any type of organization, if a student finds that they want to build an organization of their own, um, it is a very um, straightforward process. Um, typically, they have to have five founding members, and then they can start recruiting and building their own club based on what they want to do. And then a big part of any university life um, and a very big part for our campus as well is our career services office. Um, they do one on one career counseling. Even now, while we are in um, this period of COVID-19 and we are in a virtual environment, um, our career counselors are still doing one on one counseling sessions with students via Zoom or other types of um, digital communication. Um, they also just wrapped up a virtual career fair. So they brought about 150 companies into a virtual uh, room um, to meet and network with our students. Um, once we are back on campus, we will have you know, a lot more opportunity to utilize different programs that we've used. Um, a big one is our Insights to Industry program. So this is a field trip program where students can go and visit local companies, uh, whether that be like PepsiCo, um, or Amazon Intake Center that's about 20 minutes away from our campus um, to meet with professionals within those work environments and really get to see firsthand what the work culture looks like at those different companies. 
our recreation center is also a big part of you know campus life um, as it is with any institution um, our rec center is just about 10 years old now um, and offers a lot of different types of things um, it's free for students to utilize any of the equipment as well as any of the classes um, so we do offer like spinning and yoga pilates um, strength and wellness type of sessions um, so students can utilize those for free um, and that is something that you would have to ask different campuses but some campuses will charge for classes um, and some will offer them for free while we're in this virtual environment um, the rec center um, as a building is um, not available to students in the interest of safety um, currently um, in the state of california gyms cannot be open um, that will be happening later in later phases of um, kind of reopening the state. But in the meantime, our recreation team, um, they're offering, offering their classes in a virtual setting. So they are offering specific exercise classes to do exercises that students could do from home without any type of equipment. Um, so they're doing like strength um, types of sessions with students um, without using any type of equipment with using like their body weight um, to do that type of exercise, um, trying to make sure that our students stay healthy even when they're, you know, quarantined at home. Um, so they've um, really been focusing on making sure that, you know, the physical wellness um, helps, con you know, continue for students even when we're at a very stressful and certain time. Um, the campus also has um, a rental center at the rec center. So once the, the building opens up again, students can rent out like skis or equipment for soccer or baseball or things like that um, to use for free um, and then bring that back to the rec center when they're, when they're finished. Another program that's really unique to the campus is our adventure program. Um, so because of our proximity to a lot of really interesting places in the United States. You know, we're about five hours from the Grand Canyon, we're five hours from San Francisco, we're an hour away from the beach. Um, our recreation center um, really took it upon themselves to build a program for students, to give them access to go and do things. Um, because where you go to study for your undergraduate, you know, you're gonna spend four years of studying there, but also you're gonna be set, spending four years of your young adult life there. And so you do want to build memories and to build experiences outside of going to school um, that you could really take with you after this. Um, your university time is really precious because you're not working um, full time and you have a lot of time to be able to go and explore and, and do that. So these are some examples of different trips that they offer throughout the year, obviously right now um, because of COVID-19. Um, they aren't offering trips at, the, at this point, um, but they are preparing trips for when the campus is able to offer these again. Um, the way that these trips happen is that students leave from the campus, so transportation is completely covered for them to the site wherever they're going, whether it's surfing or rafting or snowshoeing. They bring them back to the campus afterwards. They have a professional guide who can walk them through how to kayak or um, how to use climbing equipment to rock climb um, off of, you know, free rocks. And then um, in terms of the cost for the trips, we do cost sharing. So students pay a third of the co actual cost of the trip for their seat and the university pays the students other two thirds for them. Um, so typically students find that it's cheaper to do these trips versus trying to do this on their own. Um, and you can find this information if you search CSUSB Adventure. You can see the calendar of events from last academic year to give you an example of what they did and what those costs look like. The campus also hosts what's called the Inland Empire Center for Entrepreneurship. So within our area of the Los Angeles kind of greater region, we're called the Inland Empire because um, we're a little bit more inland, not necessarily right on the coast. Um, and so our entrepreneurship center over the last 10 years um, has helped build over 80,000 startups. Um, so whether that is mentoring students or other community members on building startups, um, our faculty members who many of them own businesses themselves have been an integral part of building new innovation and, built, and business within the greater Los Angeles area. 
We have a couple degree programs that focus in on entrepreneurship, but you don't necessarily have to be an entrepreneurship student to participate. You'll see here just kind of the legacy of the center um, having been around um, for over 15 years. Um, it's been a very big part of our campus mission as well. A couple of examples of different programs that there are. Um, you'll see like the Upstarters Entrepreneurship Club, the Women's Business Center, the Innovation Challenge, which um, is a competition challenge for students who have a product idea or a startup idea. Um, they are awarded up to $10,000 in scholarships for their different types of ideas. The Fast Pitch Challenge is another competition that happens in the spring. Uh, innovation happens in the fall. Um, students can win up to $4,000 in scholarships for that uh, program as well. So then we talked a little bit about degrees and programs before when we were talking about how colleges are divided up. But just so you can see again, the majors at the university, we have a couple of majors that are marked in red here. Um, so red programs are indicated um, as impacted. So what impacted means is that last year, there were more students who applied and were eligible academically for the programs that are marked there than there were seats available. <coughs> So those programs have to set higher admission criteria beyond the standard um, admission criteria for the campus. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, in terms of camp, like kind of highlights of our campus and things that we're known for, cybersecurity is a really big program at my campus. We have an undergraduate and a graduate certificate, as well as a bachelor's and a master's degree in cybersecurity. Um, we are designated as a center of academic excellence and information assurance by the National Security Agency and the Department of Homeland Security. What does that mean? Um, so in the US right now, um, the Department of Homeland Security and the NSA, um, those US government divisions, they give this designation um, as um, kind of like the highest accreditation for cybersecurity schools. There's only about 20 schools in the country that have this designation. Um, and we have this designation for both our bachelor's and our master's degrees in cybersecurity. Um, so we are one of the top cybersecurity schools in the country. We are the top when it comes to the state of California within the CSU system. Um, so um, this, is, this is what we do. Uh, we have a, a government funded cybersecurity lab um, that came with our accreditation as well that our students and our faculty do research in. Um, we have a cyber defense team that competes nationally against other top ranked universities. And we find that a lot of employers will come and actively just recruit our cybersecurity students even outside of the career fair. So we see them come on campus a lot. Um, and set up in the student center and or even right outside of cybersecurity classes um, to talk with our students and try to get them to consider them as um, a company possibility after they graduate. Um, so it's a very different kind of dynamic than we see with a lot of other programs where um, companies are actively trying to recruit our students rather than students who are actively trying to seek jobs at certain companies. Most of our cybersecurity students will have two to three job offers before they graduate. So then looking at a breakdown of kind of estimates for fees, this is um, the campus estimates when it comes to tuition and then also what we expect living expenses and other expenses to be when you come to study in the United States. Um, this is based on one academic year. And the living expenses is based upon campus housing. We do not require any of our students to live on campus if they don't want to, unless they're under 18 um, and they don't have a parent or guardian in the area, we would require them to live on campus until they turn 18. At my university, we also offer what's called the Presidential Non-Resident Scholarship. This is available to all undergraduate students in the amount of 6,000 US dollars per year towards the tuition. So it brings your tuition to around 10,000 US dollars per year. 
to be eligible for this award, um, all that you need is a 3.5 minimum GPA. Um, we don't look at SAT scores or any other type of essays or test scores or things like that. We just need to see that from high school you had a 3.5 US GPA. Another thing that I wanted to note to you about our institution that is kind of unique um, is our summer session. So students are required to live or to study in the fall and the spring uh, full time and the summer is an optional term for students. Um, during the fall and spring, the state of California designates how much we have to charge for tuition for students who are considered out of state, who are not taxpayers of the state of California. During the summer, we are not held to that same requirement. So as a campus, it is our mission to help students um, have affordable and accessible options to graduate early if possible. And so during the summer, all of our students, whether they are from India or California or New York, um, they all pay in-state California resident tuition. So what does that look like when we compare it to that 16,000 or roughly 8,000 uh, US dollars for 12 semester units? You'll see here a breakdown um, the tuition per unit information here. Um, so the non-resident tuition um, cost is uh, that $270 plus a, roughly around 400 US dollars per credit. During the summer, that $400 of non-resident fees are not added to the cost there. So you are saving a considerable amount of money taking courses in a summer. Um, so a lot of our students, they'll go home for the summer. Um, they will take online summer courses to save some money and also just get ahead in their classes as well. So that's also something to consider if you do come to my campus. Now, talking about admission requirements, this gives you a breakdown of um, what our kind of general requirements would be. We'll just mainly talk about the freshman requirements here. So we look for a high school GPA of a 2.5 or above. Um, now keep in mind that scholarship requires a 3.5 or higher. For students who have a GPA between a 2.0 and a 2.49, we do offer a path to admission through our academic pathway program. Um, the way that pathway programs work in the state of California <coughs> is that um, every course that you take in the pathway has to go towards your final degree at the university. So you aren't taking any type of like study skills class or something like that that won't count towards your degree. All of it is going to be university courses. So you're going to be taking your university composition class. You're going to be taking your university math course, your lab science course, um, your fine arts course. What is different for students in the pathway program is that they cannot take more than 12 semester units per term and they have to work with an academic coach so they have a professional staff member who is there to be a resource for them to help them um, if they need help getting resources on campus um, utilizing tutoring and things like that after they finish that first year if they have a 2.75 or higher they will then kind of like graduate from the app program and they no longer need to speak with that academic coach and they can enroll in as many courses as they want. For our first time freshmen, we do require a TOEFL IELTS um, or a Duolingo score. Um, currently, the Duolingo requirements, I think I'll have that up on the next slide, um, has been put in place for fall of 2020, but we are looking at extending that to spring of 2021, um, given that testing is still very uncertain around the world. And we also offer conditional admission through our English language program. Students have to complete level three. So this is a breakdown here of the Duolingo, the current policy for the Duolingo exam. Um, like I said, right now, currently it's in place for fall of 2020. Um, we are working on extending that through spring of 2021 since TOEFL and IELTS testing is still a bit uncertain. Um, the minimum score that we require for undergrads is that 95. So for first time freshmen, this is their checklist of what they have to submit. You submit your application on CSU Apply, um, which is that unified application for all the Cal States. You'll 
um, email us your high school transcripts and your graduation certificate or diploma. Um, we can take those scanned emailed copies to get you your offer of admission. And then when you come to campus, um, you can bring those original documents. Or you can mail those original documents if you'd like right now. Um, we're recommending doing the emailing um, just because we're working virtually as well. So we only have one staff member who's coming to campus once a week to pick up mail. And as we talked about English proficiency requirements, um, all the different, op different options that you have. We don't require an SAT or ACT for admission. We don't require essays or letters of recommendation. We just wanna see an application. How did you do in high school? And do you have the English proficiency requirement? <coughs> um, filing periods and deadlines. This is a breakdown for the upcoming academic year. So for our fall of 2020 term, we are still open um, until the end of July. Um, and then for spring, we will stay open until early January. Then a couple of other little points here. Keep an eye on those deadlines. Um, if you have any questions, you are always welcome to reach out to my team at international at csusb.edu. And here's a couple more points of contact that we already talked about a bit. Now on this last slide, I, I do want to address, um, you know, we've had a lot of questions from students about um, course offerings, how we're going to have our fall term, what, what are kind of, what are we doing um, with everything that's going on in the world right now? So you may have seen um, the CSU system president who oversees the 23 campuses um, made an announcement in mid-May um, that in the interest of public health and the health and safety of our students, our faculty and our staff, for fall of 2020, all of our courses are going to be taught in a virtual setting. There are exceptions that are being made to that virtual setting for certain courses where it is impossible for that to happen. For example, a nursing clinical where nursing students are graded on how they work in a hospital, that cannot be done virtually. So those students are going to be um, going to campus or going to their site locations to finish those pieces for their courses. But the majority of courses are going to be taught in a virtual setting for the fall. Um, for the state of California, since we are not um, in, we're only in, I think we're in phase two of reopening at this point. Um, there's a four phase process the state has kind of designated in different parameters for that. We are not going to open under a phase two or with the potential that we may have to backtrack to a previous phase. Um, we want to give our students the consistency that their courses are going to be taught in a certain way. We don't want to see the uncertainty that happened last spring where courses were on campus and then we switched to a virtual setting and there was just a lot of transition in terms of making sure students had the Wi-Fi bandwidth, had the um, technology resources, the training and understanding of how those courses would be taught and that our faculty would be able to successfully teach those courses um, without a lot of hiccups. So, that's what it's going to look like for all of the CSU campuses for the fall. Um, most of the courses will be done in a virtual setting. Um, for students who are applying for F-1 visas, um, you can still apply for an F-1 visa. If you're granted an F-1 visa, you can come to the US while we're teaching virtually. Since we have made this a policy uh, institution wide, um, the US government um, has extended its current permissions that allow students who are on F-1 visas to take their courses in a virtual setting if the campus is in a virtual environment for the term. So you do have that option um, if you do have visa interview slots that you're scheduling. Um, if you're going to a CSU, you'll be able to, you know, move forward with that. If you decide that you want to take your courses virtually from home, um, a lot of our students are considering that option as well. Um, that's totally fine as well. With the courses, um, some of them are going to be taught in what's called a synchronous and some will be taught in what's called an asynchronous schedule. So a synchronous sequence will be a course where 
the professor is going to log on and have a live lecture and you are expected to log on at the same time and meet live with the professor. And if you're looking at some other campuses that are going to be virtual and considering them, this is also something that you're going to want to keep an eye on, that synchronous for a versus asynchronous teaching. So if you're in a synchronous course, if they're gonna meet California time at 2 p.m. Um, in California, it's gonna be 2 a.m. in India. Um, so that's just something to consider as well. Um, an, an asynchronous course is a course where the professor is going to pre-record lectures. You're going to be expected throughout the week to listen to the lectures and then respond to questions or the discussion forum, panel, whatever they're going to have to kind of make sure that you're following along with the material. Um, so that's also something to consider as you're looking at different campuses, if they are in a virtual setting, how they're teaching those virtual classes. Um, so I did want to mention that um, I know there were some news articles that came out that said that the CSU campus was going to be closed for the fall. Our physical campuses are going to be very limited, um, but they are not closed. We've never actually closed all the buildings. Um, there are still staff that are there. There are still researchers that are there. Um, we are also keeping our housing open because for some of our students, um, our housing is their home while they are here. For a lot of our international students, our housing is their home. And so we are keeping our housing open even through the fall while we're teaching virtually. We'll keep food open for our students who are living on campus as well. Um, so that is just something to note with um, the campus system. If you had heard, you know, kind of what was going on um, in the interest of making sure that our students can have a good, successful, consistent term um, and in the interest of everyone's public health and safety, we are staying in a virtual setting for the fall, um, but the campus services will stay available to students throughout that time. So that is all that I have. We have a lot of different questions here. So I guess we can start from the top, Kunal. Yes, absolutely. And you can go over them. Uh, please don't worry about the time limit because I know, um, you know, you, you can go over them at your own pace and have these covered. Okay. So thank you so much. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. So there's a question here on how do college credits work? So typically at institutions um, that have some kind of a, a government accreditation, like the WASC, for example, or things like that, um, a college credit is um, a measurement of time that was spent in the class. So one college credit is equivalent to one hour of lecture per week for 16 weeks and the equivalent um, out of class work that you would need to spend. Typically they say for one hour of lecture you should spend one to two hours outside of class working on your homework, your papers, studying for your exams, things like that. <coughs> So uh, most courses are three credits. So what that means is that you're going to be spending three hours a week in class, class lectures. So typically they'll have like a Monday, Wednesday, Friday from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. lecture. And then you'll have homework to do that should take anywhere from about three to six hours potentially. Um, every student they'll find homework is gonna be a little different, um, but that's just kind of how the faculty members build their schedules and measure their courses. Um, so that is, yeah, like I said, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 9 to 10 a.m. Um, from for 16 weeks, including a final exam week. Um, for full-time enrollment uh, to be in compliance with an F1 visa, for fall and spring, students have to be in at least 12 credit hours. So that's typically four courses that are meeting three hours a week whether that is a night course that meets for three hours one day a week, or if there's like a Tuesday, Thursday for an hour and a half each, um, each class is gonna be a little different. And um, in order to finish a degree in four years, um, every degree in the US, you have to finish the equivalent of 120 credit hours. So that divided out over four years is 15 credits per semester. So if you are only taking 12, the 12 hour minimum, you would need to catch up those other six hours either during a summer term or maybe if you have a, a accelerated winter term at an institution 
um, to get to that 15 per semester to get done with the 120 in four years. So um, then we've got a question about, we were talking a little bit about differences between colleges and universities. And the question is, um, does a university mean research and a college means no research in general? Not necessarily. Um, a university is a designation for an institution that, off, that offers both bachelor's and master's degrees or bachelor's, master's, and doctorates. Typically, the higher degrees that an institution offers, the more research takes place at those institutions, but not necessarily. Um, so um, with some colleges, especially colleges that have a long history and a long legacy, you'll see this a lot on the East Coast. Um, there are these um, really wonderful um, undergraduate colleges that offer um, programs in like environmental science or um, sustainability and things like that. And they do a lot of research um, within their kind of focused subject areas um, that they're known for. But a, an institution like UC Berkeley, the University of California, Berkeley, um, is a huge institution that has a ton of doctorate programs and a ton of research. Um, so, the, you know, the larger and the higher the designation is, the more resources there are for an institution to do more extensive research. And then we see, I see a question here about can academic advisors provide advice on which professors for a particular class would be a good fit for me? Um, most academic advisors are going to be very um, sensitive and careful on how they do this. Um, some will say, I'm not going to give you a recommendation. Um, others will kind of guide you in saying, you know, do you prefer classes that have a lot of um, papers versus exams? Because even within like a, a general um, history class, um, everyone in the state of California, for example, at a public institution has to take an American civics class. We'll use that as an example. Different professors, one professor may require more exams, whereas one's going to have more papers, presentations, and projects. So sometimes they'll do that to kind of guide you through, um, you know, what you find to be most helpful for you to be academically successful. Some people like tests more than writing papers, and sometimes they'll use that as kind of a guiding point. Um, but they typically won't say, like, this professor is really grumpy and you shouldn't take classes with him and this professor is really nice um, because the advisors work with all of these faculty members. They're kind of the bridge between you and them. And so they have to keep a good rapport between you and the faculty members as well. And then I see a question, what is the differences between a semester, a trimester, and a quarterly system? So my institution, we just wrapped up. Um, we used to be on a quarter system. We, this is our last term currently. Um, students are just graduating um, this past weekend uh, off of our quarter system. So I can speak a little bit to that. Um, it, it all comes down to how um, the scheduling and sequencing goes. So like I said, a semester system is 16 weeks. So 15 weeks of lecture followed by um, a week of exams. <coughs> um, the, in terms of the in-class time, a credit between a semester, quarter, or trimester is the same. It's an hour of lecture for one credit, but the way the credit is seen is a little different. Um, so for a semester, like I said, 16 weeks. A quarter system is 10 weeks of instruction with a week of exam included in that. And a quarter unit versus a semester unit um, is weighed differently. So, um, for example, a, in terms of semester credit, um, if you had a semester credit and you were transferring that to a quarter system, one semester credit is seen as 1.5 quarter units, whereas a quarter unit is seen as like a half a semester unit. Um, so, because you're in class less um, time, the credit, if you move it from one type of system to another, it's seen differently. So for a quarter, an institution that's on a quarter system, you have to finish 180 quarter units 
to finish your degree program. With trimesters, I'm not as familiar with trimester systems. Um, my institution has never been on that kind of a system. My understanding is trimesters typically um, are a little bit in the middle between the two. So it will be usually about like 13, 12 to 13 weeks versus the 10 weeks of a quarter or uh, 16 weeks of a semester. And that credit is seen um, as like three quarters of a semester credit. So students have to finish um, my understanding is about 150 trimester units to finish their degree. Let's see here. I am scrolling kind of crazy right now. Hold on. So how many offers, office hours per week do professors usually provide? Typically at our institution, um, for every credit hour that the course is considered, they have to spend an hour of office hours. So specifically for that class. So if it's a three credit hour course, the faculty members will typically put on their syllabus three hours where they will have that open office hour time specifically for the students in that class. Um, so they may offer that all on one day. Um, they may offer it once uh, every day for three days. Um, other faculty members, they will put for their office hours on their syllabus, they will put all of the hours that they're going to be in their office that they're not teaching or doing research. So if they do that, um, you know, you can utilize any of those hours. They may be meeting with other students from a couple other classes, um, but that's also something that some of them will do. Then a question here, do CSU campuses specialize in different programs? Um, each of us do have kind of different strengths um, and kind of specializations. Um, like I said, with my campus, computers are a big thing at my campus. We don't have an engineering school. So that is something that, you know, we have strengths and we have things that we don't necessarily fill. Um, so each of us do have different types of programs. Um, like for example, Monterey Bay, which is right on the coast, um, they have a huge marine biology program, whereas we're by the mountains, so we don't. Um, so you can find all the different programs on calstate.edu and you know, take a look and see um, which ones have the specializations that you're looking for. So then I see a question about joining a sports team at CSU San Bernardino. If you're looking to join an NCAA designated uh, sports team, so part of that NCAA Division II with the, the, some of the scholarships, things like that, the NCAA has a very specific process where you have to apply to become an NCAA athlete and apply for the university at the same time. Um, most students will start this process in their junior year. Um, so you have to um, both meet the compliance for the NCAA, as well as um, begin the application process with the coaches at the institution and start applying for admission to the institution. Um, like I said, it's it's something that you do want to get started early on. I'm not sure if there will be a session um, upcoming on NCAA or just kind of sports at US institutions, um, but I would recommend going to NCAA.org um, and they have a lot of really good resources to give you kind of step by step. Um, and you're always, like I said, you're always welcome to email me um, and I'd be happy to get you connected to specific coaches at our NCAA teams. If you're looking at like intramural sports, which are hosted at our recreation center, these are student club sports. Um, that process is very simple. Once you come to the university, um, you just register through the recreation center and they will connect you with a team and you can compete against other student teams at the institution. Um, there aren't any scholarships with that um, type of sport, but a lot of our students um, like to do that in addition to their studies. Um, and then let's see here. 
Um, for our campus, our closest airport is the Ontario International Airport. It's roughly 20 minutes away from our campus, whereas um, Los Angeles International Airport um, is roughly around an hour away from the campus. Um, so both of them, we have students that come to the campus through them. Um, it really just depends on what your preferences are. If you want to get a direct flight to LAX and then um, come to campus from there or connect through like San Francisco and then come to Ontario. Let's see here, popular clubs for students on campus. Um, we have a big gaming camp, um, club on our campus. Um, they do video games. We have a big anime club, for example. Um, our um, biology club is also very popular. We're also a very involved um, kind of volunteering campus. So we have several different clubs that focus on um, service to the community and service around the world. Uh, we had students that went to Puerto Rico a year ago um, to help with the hurricane relief efforts through a student club. So um, there's a lot of different types of organizations to choose from. And you can join as many as you'd like. Um, our campus, we have 20,000 students on campus um, that take classes. We have roughly, I would say about 4,000 students who live in campus housing. So um, it is a percentage of our campus, but not the majority of our students necessarily live on campus. The rest will commute. And then with our Palm Desert campus, we have roughly 5,000 students who live and study at that uh, regional campus. In terms of campus life, um, when we are when we're no longer in, in a COVID situation, um, campus life is very dynamic um, within the physical campus. Um, they have different types of activities that they offer throughout the year. So typically in the spring, they have a concert series. Um, in the winter, they will have uh, a snow day on campus. So they bring snow from the mountains down to the, the campus quad, as you can see there with um, the the kind of green area between all the buildings. Um, they'll just set up a whole bunch of snow there. Um, we have a homecoming week uh, where we celebrate um, just student life and have sports events and a carnival and things like that. Um, so there's a lot of different types of things that happen. Um, we have guest lectures, um, big kinds of uh, competition nights and um, one thing that I found really interesting, they, they do this event called the, the crate stacking challenge or something in the rec center where they basically um, tie a, a student like, or strap a student to a rope and they take milk crates and they try to stack as high as they can, um, roughly 30 to 40 feet up in the air. And uh, they just continue building this giant tower until it falls. It's quite entertaining to watch. So let's see here, we've got a question about um, Indian students at the campus. So the majority of our Indian students are postgraduate students. Um, I would say currently we have about 50 Indian students um, who are on F1 visas. Um, and then we have roughly another 100 Indian students who are um, either US citizens or permanent residents at the campus. Um, so it is, um, there is a dynamic with um, both of those populations, but they do um, all you know, work together very well. Uh, of the 50 F1s, I would say roughly 10 of them are undergrads, the other 40 are postgrad. Um, with both of those populations, we do have an Indian Student Association um, that kind of connects all of those different um, groups of students together um, on different projects and initiatives. <coughs> we have um, some of our Indian students are graduate assistants. Um, we've had Indian students who have been resident assistants with campus housing. So for those who may not be familiar with what resident assistants are, um, they are student leaders in the housing 
um, that are there that live in housing with other students and they're kind of the emergency contact. They're there to make sure that um, students are um, not putting things on their walls or, you know, breaking their doors or different things like that. Um, resident assistants get their housing paid for. That is their compensation for their work. So we've had some Indian students who have done that as well. here. Um, so we have a question about pursuing a major in business administration and then a minor in like computer science or IT. This is a very common combination for our campus. Um, our information systems and technology department is housed within our College of Business, which is kind of a unique setting, but it works really well because so much of IT now is branding and awareness and budgeting and personnel management and so um, it works really well that our information systems division is within our business school. So our students in those degree programs have exposure to that. So absolutely, you can do a major in, you know, management or supply chain or marketing and do your minor in computer science, um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, cybersecurity. There's a lot of different options that you would have even within kind of the IT world for your minor. Let's see here, we've got a question about campus safety and also safety due to COVID-19. Very good questions um, and very relevant to, you know, everything that's going on in the world right now. So um, our campus, we have a licensed police force on campus. So. Some campuses do this, some don't. It really depends. Typically larger campuses that have over, you know, 10,000 students will do this. Um, what this means is that our um, campus police force is trained by the state um, and they have an extended kind of jurisdiction beyond the campus. Um, so they provide safety to the campus, but also safety to all the streets that come into campus. Um, which just helps extend our, our overall campus safety. For campuses that only have like licensed security guards, they cannot um, monitor anything outside of the campus um, kind of borders. So um, that's one really good benefit for us. Um, we do have three big streets that feed into the campus. And so um, our campus police are able to monitor situations in all those different areas. Um, in terms of campus safety, we typically rank in the top five for the CSU campuses in terms of safety. Every, every year we rank a little differently, but typically we're within the, the top five. Um, all, of, all public institutions in the state of California have public records on the state's website in terms of um, what police reports had been filed for the previous year. Um, so you can find that information on their website. Um, typically with um, any institution in the state of California, um, any type of uh, crime that happens, it's typically crimes of convenience. So if um, a laptop is left on a bench um, and someone picked it up and took it, that is a filed police report for theft. Um, and so it's just being aware of your surroundings and knowing there's a lot of people around and not everybody is has the best of intentions and may want to take advantage of if you put things down. Um, and then in terms of COVID-19 um, safety measures and things like that, um, for, like I said, for our campus, the campus as a, as a physical location is still considered open, but it's limited. Um, so students who want to stay in housing can stay in housing um, they are each assigned to an individual room for social distancing purposes. Campus food is still available, but during limited hours. Um, so they have very specific times to have their breakfast, lunch, and dinner versus typically when we have um, longer extended open hours from 7 a.m. to midnight. Right now they may have breakfast from like 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. and then lunch from noon to two and dinner from five to seven or something like that just to keep things limited um, and keep our food staff safe. Um, campus police continue to monitor 24 hours a day the campus. Um, and then 
other types of um, services that are available still on campus. The campus health clinic is still there on campus. The nurses are there. If any of our on-campus students need to see them for any services or things like that, um, we have set up sanitation stations across the campus um, currently for those who are still residing on campus um, since there is a limited number, but there is um, you know, a concern there. Um, most of the other buildings are locked throughout the day, so the library is not um, available to students to spend time in there. The student union um, has stayed locked in the interest of keeping um, everyone safe and healthy. So um, in terms of, of, of safety measures and things like that, um, following the guidelines that the campus sets, um, whether it's you know, CSUSB or any other campus, um, everyone is setting guidelines and recommendations, but it's very much the standard of, you know, keeping your distance. Um, on campus, everyone has to wear a mask when they're outside and they're not in their rooms. Um, sanitizing um, spaces and things like that. So that's the current measures that we're doing and keeping our classes in a virtual setting so we're not putting students or our faculty members in any kind of jeopardy to be in spaces where there are more people um, and more opportunity for infection to spread. Um, so then a question here about the merit-based scholarship. So for the non-resident scholarship, it's a $6,000 award, um, and that is the tier that it's at. Um, there are other scholarships that are available at the university. Um, that you may be eligible to apply to beyond this award. So, for example, there's like a student government leadership award and there are merit-based scholarships within the major departments. So you may be eligible for a few other awards beyond ours, uh, but ours is a general award for all major programs. And then I see a question about English proficiency waivers. So um, we, for like international baccalaureate degree programs, um, for some we can offer a waiver. What we would need to do is see a copy of your high school transcripts. Um, so we can see the high school institution that you're studying at and uh, determine whether we would be able to grant a waiver for the English proficiency requirements. Um, for most we can, but for some we are unable to. And then let's see here, we've got a question about um, jobs and internships. Um, so in terms of jobs and internships, I think, and especially now with everything that's going on with COVID-19, as you may be aware, um, worldwide, there's been a lot of uncertainty in kind of the job market and things like that. Um, most of our um, students who are graduating now, um, since they did graduate this past weekend, we don't have a lot of good quantifiable data on how their job search process has looked and what their current status is in terms of job securement. Um, but in general, um, especially with everything that's going on right now, um, different fields have very different kinds of outlooks and very different kinds of journeys to kind of find and secure a job. So for our campus, we're um, very, um, we have a very good reputation for our IT degrees. Um, those students typically do very well in securing jobs. Like I said, um, since our students have just graduated, we, don't, we won't have quantifiable data from them on their job status until we complete a survey um, with them, which we send out 30 days after they graduate. <coughs> but in terms of our December students who graduated, um, typically, we see the IT students are the most successful in securing a job quickly. Business students are also quite successful. Um, our uh, science students also do very well, our peer science students. Um, so there is kind of a tier in terms of like the job outlook and prospects. But um, in terms of internships, um, the majority of our undergrad programs highly encourage internship in um, the second or third year of the undergrad degree and a lot of our students utilize that. Um, so we typically see our students continue to stay in the greater Los Angeles area for work in a lot of different industries. 
Um, we see a mixed bag between students who go to large companies, um, you know, companies like Amazon or Walmart or things like that. We have a big Walmart supply chain um, kind of intake center near us. And so we do see a lot of our supply chain students go there. Uh, we also see a lot of students who go and work for startups since we do have that Center for Entrepreneurship and a very large startup presence. Um, we do see some students build their own startup or work at startups as well. Let's see here, housing at the campus. So we have two apartment style housing units at the campus. These are available to upperclassmen. Um, so students who have completed at least their first year at the university and are postgraduate students. And then we have two traditional dormitory style housing units. Um, so these are what you see in the US movies um, with, you know, the room and the two roommates. Um, there may be a shared bathroom or things like that. That's available only to our first time freshman students, those two housing units. Like I said, all housing is optional. So if a student wants to live off campus in their first semester, as long as they're over 18, they can do that. Um, we do find a lot of our students um, live in apartments near our campus. Um, there's roughly enough apartment units for around 10,000 people within a five minute walk from campus. So we do see a lot of students who utilize that as well as an option. It's um, very much up to you. And like I said, currently with COVID-19, we are keeping our housing units open for students who need to utilize housing during this time. Let's see, we've got another question here about, um, I think the College Board of Secondary Education board students, whether they would be held for an English requirement. Um, it's going to depend on the institution. We have to look at um, how your institution classifies language of instruction um, and the accreditations of the high school. So we'll, we would just need to get a copy of your high school transcripts and then our evaluation team can take a look at that information. Um, something else to address in terms of evaluating transcripts for grades and things like that. Um, my campus does not accept third party evaluations. We do all of our evaluations in house. We have a team of uh, admission evaluators who do all of those assessments. So all you have to do is just email your transcripts to us and our evaluation team can take a look and give you insight on all of that. So let's see here, how many international undergraduate students are at your main campus? So of our 800 international students, roughly 500 to 550 are undergrad. Um, so they are the majority of our international student population. And like I said, roughly 18,000 undergraduate students are at the main campus. So um, they do make up the majority of the student population on the campus as well. I think that was the last question that we have um, at least posted to the Q&A. Absolutely. And uh, before I come on live, uh, um, if you could just kindly put your email address in the Q&A, I think it's always helpful for people to get in touch. I think it was earlier sure. put in the chat box that's not accessible. Uh, and uh, to all the attendees, I'm just going to quickly launch a poll as uh, Ms. Rebecca, um, you know, shares her email uh, details with us. So uh, please note it down for further questions. I think we've run out of time, but it's always uh, good to uh, have these conversations uh, going in the future. And with that said, I am going to be coming back online. I hope everyone can see me now. And um, yes, absolutely. We have a quick five more seconds remaining. So uh, we're going to quickly, um, you know, provide that. So thank you so much. I think really appreciate uh, to all the attendees who have answered yes. I think all of them have answered yes. So really appreciate um, um, the poll results that we're seeing out here. And uh, glad to know that you found it very helpful. And to Ms. Rebecca, I would like to thank you for taking the time. I know there were a lot of questions today um, that came your way, but um, really, really appreciate uh, you taking the time out to uh, sharing this valuable information about, um, you know, about your, not only your institution, but about the session topic that you had today. Right. And I'm sure these conversations will continue to keep on going. And to all the attendees, um, we are also going to be recording this session. This session is recorded. 
and it will be shared with your high school and other high schools as we've done with our other workshops so as to ensure you can share it and relearn and rewatch it with your um, other students or parents or guidance counselors. And uh, please join me in saying thank you to Ms. Rebecca. And uh, Ms. Rebecca, thank you once again. It was an immense pleasure hosting you today. Thank you, Kanal. And I wish everyone a good evening. Um, stay safe, healthy, and well. And um, as you have my contact information, should you have any questions for me about anything that we discussed today, you're always welcome to reach out to me. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. And I uh, wish you a wonderful day in California. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Goodbye. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.